Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dave Armstrong. I'm the new rheumatologist for um, those I haven't met yet. Um, but excited to be here. I know you guys are anxious to learn a lot about rheumatology, not having one for your entire residency. So, and congratulations, or I'm sorry, and best of luck with the future. I know it's a tough slot on match day, so I see a lot of excitement out there already. Um, most of my lectures are a little bit interactive, so feel free to chime in. Um, I will ask some questions, so not to pimp you guys or anything like that, but um, just to help kind of reinforce um, kind of knowledge and learning. Has anybody here seen any spondyloarthropathies in their clinic or in the wards? Anybody? Silence? What are we, what are we talking about when we're dealing with spondyloarthropathy? You know what type of diseases that kind of encompasses? Feel free to speak up. It's open forum. Yeah, ankylosing spondylitis. So that's kind of the, the classic um, spondyl arthropathy, right, involving the spine. Any other disease processes, you know, that kind of fall under that category of inflammation? Okay. So others would include uh, psoriatic arthritis, which has a variety of presentations but can involve the spine itself. Uh, reactive arthritis, which can be a reaction to... Um, Bacteria that are kind of similar to viruses, pathogens of the GI system, upper respiratory tract, um, and chlamydia are kind of classic examples of uh, bacteria that can turn on the immune system and cause inflammation in the spine. Um, also, you have this other category of, you know, radiographically negative spondyl arthropathy, which is more common in females, and then a not otherwise specified category. But that really encompasses most of the categories of disease that we deal with, the one other would also be inflammatory bowel disease, associated arthritis, which can be associated with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis as well. Um, so a couple of stock disclosures that I have. Um, other than that, they shouldn't affect this presentation. Um, I also work with Michael to include some uh, mix app questions for you guys um, that will kind of be answered during the course of the lecture, but we'll go through these. Um, and when you're approaching board questions, I'm sure they've gone over this with you, but probably the best approach is to read the question first and answers and then go through the text um, itself looking for what exactly is being asked. So this question is, which of the following is the most appropriate diagnostic test to perform next? ANCA testing, CCP antibody testing, ANA testing, HLA B27 testing, or no additional testing? And really the, the question is asking about a younger female with longstanding back pain taking naproxen or an anti-inflammatory for relief. Um, she has reduced motion in her spine and also tenderness over the SI joints and then demonstrates fusion of the sacroiliac joints. So pretty classic for a spondyloarthropathy. Uh, the next question, which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? Diclofenac, etanercept, methotrexate, or sulfasalazine? So again, a young man, buttock pain, worsened, improves with exercise, doesn't improve with rest. Symptoms have gone on for about a year. Um, additionally, testing demonstrates a positive HLA B27 genetic test, uh, negative CRP or normal CRP, and, and negative additional testing, as well as normal plain films. Last question, which of the following is the most efficacious medication to add to this patient's treatment regimen? Abatacept, which is also known as Orencia, the brand name, hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, Infliximab or Remicade, and Rituximab. So middle-aged lady with increasing pain and swelling in her knee. She has a history of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis treated with a DMARD methotrexate, presenting with elevated inflammatory marker, the ESR, and swelling and tenderness on the joints with an elevated white count on aspiration of one of her symptomatic joints, her left knee. So really when we look at spondyloarthropathy, you know, you're going to see a lot of back pain in your clinic. You know, when we look at back pain, you know, of that, you know, percentage of back pain that you're going to see, only about 0.1% is going to be inflammatory. And really, when we talk about spondyloarthropathy, these are clinical diagnoses. Laboratory testing, x-rays, uh, really support diagnosis, but really you can glean a lot of information from a good exam, review of systems, and examination of the patient where you can diagnose these conditions. So the five factors we talk about, you know, these are young people with back pain. You know, as in the Army, you know, when I trained residents, I would tell them, these aren't the people that are going to come to you you know, soldiers, sailors, airmen that are trying to get out of physical activity. They're going to present where they have to do physical activity to improve their pain. 
They're going to get up in the middle of the night, do sit-ups, push-ups to relieve their back pain so it's more comfortable. So they actually want to exercise. They're not trying to get out of work or exercising because it makes them feel better. Um, it really progressive, you know, insidious onset. It's not. It's going to be unrelenting and not go away. And really, that snowballs fairly quickly with, you know, really affecting people's lives because they can't function because they're not sleeping because they're in pain all the time. They're having to get up, stretch their back, neck, hips, and otherwise. Um, really, persistence for three months. That really kind of weeds out strains, sprains, um, and other back injuries, um, and, and usually prolonged morning stiffness. When we deal with any inflammatory condition. Really, the stiffness that we talk about is in a bimodal pattern, prolonged in the morning and then reoccurs in the evening. The reason that occurs is because it mimics your body's natural release of cortisol. You get a big burst in the morning to wake up, which relieves inflammation that kind of declines throughout the day, um, and then declines again in the evening when you're trying to sleep and rest because of the stress hormone effects of cortisol. Um, and again, I know we talked about it a bunch of times here, um, improvement with exercise. Um, do we have a doctor's dilemma team here? Anybody on the team? Yes, there is one. All right, so we're going to hit a lot of um, pictures here today. So for those on the doctor's dilemma team, you know, kind of high yield stuff too. So I did qualify for nationals myself, so I got a lot of pride in that. I'm super nerd. So, um, but what are we looking at here on this nail? Does anybody know? Yeah, pitting. So what is pitting highly associated with? Yeah, psoriasis, right? So. If you look at your own nails and you see a couple pits, that's okay. Don't worry. You don't have to see me. You don't have to see dermatology. So 50 pits, it highly correlates with um, psoriatic arthritis, if you have 50 pits or more. You know, do we see some folks with a lot of pitting and we're pretty suspicious? Sure. But it can be normal to have a few pits, right? Um, so again, other areas that psoriasis hides in the ear canals, behind the ears, umbilicus, cleft of the buttocks. Um, you know, and so you get a lot of folks, too, that, you know, may be misinformed. They say they have eczema. Um, and really the location kind of on the um, extensor surface of the joints is more classic for psoriasis. Um, but you always want to look at the ears and ear canals and nails. The more you start looking at nails, the more you're going to find. You know, I was really humbled by a dermatologist once that I worked with. You know, I got really excited. I had one of my psoriatic arthritis patients, and I saw some, you know, knit subungal hemorrh hemorrhages. And I got really excited. I'm like, oh, I found some splinter hemorrhages. You know, do you have to get a, you know, ultrasound? Like, what's going on? She said, Dave, you're just not looking hard enough. She's like very highly associated with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And so pretty humbling. So the more you look at nails, you can find a lot of disease. Uh, but pitting is one thing you definitely want to look for. So what are you looking at here on this kind of fourth toe, big swollen toe? What do we call that? Anybody? Yeah, dactylitis or sausage toe, right? So pretty classic. Um, had someone the other day, you know, our nurse practitioner was a little bit stumped, you know, big old swollen, you know, uh, ring finger. And I said, well, we normally see this with, you know, um, psoriasis or sometimes ankylosing spondylitis, or, you know, we can see it with inflammatory bowel disease. And she goes, oh, you know, I didn't want to mention it to the nurse practitioner, but I'm having a lot of GI symptoms and my brother has Crohn's. You think that's important? I said, yeah, it's definitely important. But really easy. You know, again, these are clinical diagnoses that you can pick up on very well. You just want to know what's associated with the pattern of, of inflammation and, and really identifying those key features of inflammatory disease. All right. So everybody should know this one because it was in the dermatology lecture for Grand Rounds a couple weeks ago. Yeah, pyoderma gangrenosum, right? Um, what's it associated with? In the realm of spondyl arthropathy. So inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so we see this a lot, actually. Um, and even in, you know, patients who have had an entire, you know, small bowel or large intestine resection, you can still have a lot of pyoderma lesions as well as arthritis. That just doesn't go away. You know, when we're dealing with these conditions, you know, I think, you know, Michael put it pretty well. He said, gosh, he's like, rheumatology is all over the boards. I said, yeah, it's, it's easy. My research is super easy because, again, we deal with systemic disease which crosses multiple specialties. So I'm always looking for clues, you know, to really define patients' arthritis or, or illness as well. Um, how about this? What's going on with that left heel there? What do we call that? Fancy term. Everybody knows Achilles tendonitis, right? But really, we call it enthesitis. So you can have inflammation at tendons, whether it's golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, patellar tendonitis, Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis that's recurrent, you know, and not due to overuse. So if you get folks with a lot of tendon issues and they're really not out there, you know, swinging golf clubs or running excessively or doing a lot of sports, you know, just keep that in mind for, you know, potential signs and symptoms, you know, of a spondyl arthropathy. 
All right, how about these big red tender lesions on the shins? Exactly, right? So what are some classic diseases we see this with? Yeah, IBD, right? You can see with sarcoidosis, right? There's a triad out there that involves, you know, this as well. Um, or, you know, you can see with oral contraceptives and some other medications that can cause erythema nodosum. But a big clue for inflammatory bowel disease as well as sarcoidosis. They love those questions on boards. How about this one? Maybe got some dysuria. What's that? Reactive yeah, reactive arthritis. So this is specifically keratoderma. Um, how about this? Same thing, reactive arthritis. Like I said, fun pictures. All right, so balanitis cercinata. So those uh, big, big questions on the doctor's dilemma. I think I got one of those. So. Um, other things you can see, kind of oral ulcerations, um, which can be associated with inflammatory bowel disease, um, as well as reactive arthritis. Lupus is another one, although typically oral ulcers with lupus are painless. So really, I'm just more surprised when I find them than the patient is of having them, because um, you know, you're really surprised. <clears throat> and of course, conjunctivitis. So when we talk about the HLA B27 genetic test, which is one of the questions there, um, you know, there's some pretest probability. Um, pretty prevalent in Caucasian males in particular. So, you know, 10% prevalence, although the positive predicted value about 0.1 to 10%. Um, however, having an HLA-B27 genetic test that's positive in a female, particularly non-Caucasian, adds a lot of weight to diagnosis. So it is a marker. Um, you know, it has some sensitivity and specificity to pay, based on ethnicity and gender. Um, so when we look at sacroiliac films, I do encourage everybody to look at all the films they order. You'd be surprised how much you find um, in really looking at films in detail. When we look at the films, you can kind of see, um, I have a great, let's see those points here. No, it's right out. Um, so really you're going to see some fluorosis or white on both edges of the sacroiliac film. And then really, the image isn't great, but you'll see almost a postage stamp appearance or erosions on the tip of the basis. There is some symmetry that's associated with sacral ileitis. So when you're reading the films or looking at the radiology report, um, usually very symmetric um, sacral ileitis is more consistent with inflammatory bowel disease or ankylosing spondylitis. Reactive arthritis and psoriatic arthritis tend to be a little bit more asymmetric. Um, MRI provides a little bit more fidel fidelity. I mean, really what you're looking for is, is white on MRI, which is fluid attenuation, which is a surrogate marker for inflammation. Um, so one easy test, you know, if you have a patient, you're concerned that there may be some inflammation, um, inflammatory back pain symptoms is kind of Faber testing, um, which any osteopaths out there? All right, so you should be familiar with Faber testing, right? And all this basically is you put the patient into, you know, almost a figure four with their um, leg and press down on the knee and the opposite um, ASIS at the same time. And what that does is it puts pressure on the sacroiliac joints. And Faber testing is just, it's just an abbreviation of flexion, abduction, external rotation, and extension of the hip. But pretty easy test to do. Um, another you can do is you can have the patient lay on their side and compress the uh, SI joints just like a bookend. You know, pressure will elicit pain. And if patients have active inflammation in the sacroiliac joints, they're not going to like you very much when you do these tests, so just so you're aware. There's some other spondylitis measuring that we don't really use much anymore, but they'll show it on board questions. So kind of, you know, particularly the finger-to-floor testing, um, occiput-to-wall testing, and Schubert's testing, which, which measures kind of flexibility of the spine. Really, the reason we don't use these tests much anymore is we're catching patients very early in the disease process, getting them on good therapy, and really preventing any permanent joint damage and disability. But you'll see these kind of measures pop up on board questions, along with other clues for inflammatory back pain. Um, it really, you know, kudos to the American College of Rheumatology for really advancing early access to care, good treatment regimens, and standard of care. Um, so we have, you know, great support in the community, and Phil Mickelson is a great example of that, with terrible psoriatic arthritis where, you know, biologic therapy really changed his life and his golf game. 
you know, his, his PR lately is a separate issue. Um, so really lots of treatments. You know, the, the big thing is when we're starting treatment for, you know, a spondyl arthropathy, NSAIDs and anti-inflammatories have a lot of benefit. You know, I get a lot of patients who, you know, we start them on meloxicam. You know, they're hesitant to try something different, you know, and just feel like it's, you know, ibuprofen. But really a surprising benefit if an anti-inflammatory is taken regularly um, for these type of patients. Obviously, for more advanced disease, we have a lot of medications which are disease-specific. Um, if it's involving the axial spine, so neck, back, sacroiliac joints, really you're moving, you know, likely from an anti-inflammatory, sometimes insurance requires a trial of two, you know, to a, a biologic therapy such as a TNF inhibitor pretty quickly. Um, you know, there's a lot of medications out there. I would say boards probably focus mostly on infliximab or Remicade, um, Enbrel, and, and Humira would be the big three. The big take-home message from those therapies is that Enbrel is not approved and does not treat inflammatory bowel disease, and they like to have that differentiator on boards as well. Um, so in your differential diagnosis, which there's always other stuff that causes abnormal x-ray findings um, and, and also back pain. Has anybody out there seen any DISH or seen DISH on x-rays at all? Yeah, so really, um, when we talk about DISH, it, it's a benign condition that really um, affects multiple vertebral levels, uh, usually neck and mid-back, sometimes low back. Um, but really has almost what we call a candle wax dripping appearance where you see calcifications of the anterior spinal ligament in multiple levels. Probably easier for me to just show you a picture than describe it. Um, but here you can see you know, it can cause some strider, pneumonia, um, and kind of stiffness to the back as well. Um, so another, another thing, too, if you're seeing you know, younger patients in particular, we have it's kind of in the spectrum of psoriatic arthritis called SAFO. Um, it really kind of severe acne or psoriasis, and then you can get very severe chest pain, um, which is related to inflammation of the um, sternoclavicular joints, and then sometimes involvement of the AC joint, where it's almost like a sterile infection is how it's described as, but very severe, severe inflammation to those joint areas. Um, and we see probably one or two of those patients a year where um, usually younger spectrum, uh, late teens, early 20s, with very severe acne or psoriasis, um, where they're... Involvement of the axial spine is a little bit different. Um, anybody come across OCI before? Okay. So pretty common finding in multiparous females. So ladies that have had several children, and really you'll get some sclerosis of the SI joints, which um, occurs because of the traction um, and expansion of the ligaments in the pelvis. Um, it really, you know, different from... But we see a couple cases a year where the patients are referred for abnormal x-rays, concerned for, you know, sacroiliitis, and really it's, it's OCI, and they've had several children where you'll get this finding um, as well. Um, anybody remember the mnemonic for reactive arthritis? Hey, look at that. It's reinforced. Um, so really when we look at that, you know, um, you know, in the military, we had a lot of chlamydial infections that would cause reactive arthritis, higher predilection in patients who are HLA-B27 positive, um, but can get some other infections that are associated, you know, whether it's, um, you know, psittacosis or uh, mycoplasma or campylobacter, um, a variety of upper, upper respiratory GI and, and urinary infections will cause this. Um, but usually some urethritis, you know, arthritis, which is usually, uh, can involve the sacroiliac joints, but usually kind of, you know, posse articular at ankle here, a knee here, a wrist here, very asymmetric. Um, they can have some conjunctivitis as well. Um, but yeah, that mnemonic's pretty good to go by. You know, it will come up. Um, and really when we talk about reactive arthritis, it falls in this pattern of thirds where I can't predict how the patient's going to do. Some will just get an acute episode, it goes away. Others will have intermittent symptoms, and some will have persistent symptoms. And it kind of breaks into about 30% for each patient variable. So big points from today's lecture, okay, and then we'll, we'll get answers to the question. I'll open up to any questions you guys have um, for me and about rheumatology in general. Um, again, the HLA-B27 genetic test is not the end-all, be-all. When we test labs in rheumatology, they really support our clinical diagnosis. 
does it help? Does it give you something to hang your hat on other than x-rays and perhaps non-specific inflammatory markers? It sure does, and it can have some variability, again, like we talked about, with ethnicity as well as um, gender. Um, inflammatory back pain is better with exercise. It can't reinforce that enough. People want to want to want to feel better, um, you know. And it was kind of amusing. I had one, you know, couple husband came every visit, didn't say much, you know. The wife had ankylosing spondylitis, and we started on Humira. And she said, "I don't think it's working." Husband, mind you, has been quiet for like three, four visits. He stands up and he said, "I'll be darn. We've driven to Denver International Airport." You know, you didn't have to get out of the vehicle and stretch every five minutes because your back hurt. You know, it's working and we're not stopping it, and that's it. <laughs> Sat down, and I said, well, sir, sofa's going to seem pretty good for the next month, but it seems like the humor may be working better than you thought. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's the type of improvement that we're really looking for. But, but exercise, you know, will improve it. And remember the bimodal distribution of pain. Stiffness in the morning and pain improves throughout the day with exercise and activity and then reoccurs in the evening and nocturnal hours. Um, again, any inflammation, you know, of the eye, you know, pretty classically associated with um, spondyl arthropathy is, is uveitis and iritis. If they have red eye, inflammatory back pain symptoms, and decreased visual acuity, they need to see the ophthalmologist um, to be evaluated for uveitis. So remember that disease pattern. Nail pitting, we talked about it, psoriatic arthritis. You know, really nail pitting is highly associated with DIP involvement. I know we're talking about spondyl arthropathy. But that one likes to come up on board, so let me emphasize it. You want to know your key physical exam features and, and findings of aortic regurgitation um, because that is associated with ankylosing spondylitis. I think that was on my board exam as well. Um, and the really anti inflammatories who help all types of um, seronegative spondyl arthropathies. The one that we use caution with is kind of, you know, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Sometimes NSAIDs can worsen that. Eh, I haven't had too much problem with. Um, you know, COX-2 inhibitors, specifically meloxicam and Celebrex, seem to do, patients with enteropathic disease seem to do okay with those. So back to our questions. You know, the one was a younger lady with inflammatory back pain. She's already got fusion of her spine. She's got elevated inflammatory marker, the ESR. You know, really, she's got a spondyl arthropathy, probably ankylosing spondylitis. The, the key thing they're trying to get out of this test, or test question, is really don't need the HLA B27 to, to diagnose this patient, right? Is insurance going to ask for it? Am I going to need it if I'm going to get Humira? Sure. But for the, you know, diagnostic classification, she has inflammatory symptoms, elevated inflammatory markers, changes on x-ray, it's a slam dunk. You don't need the genetic testing. And really in, you know, females in particular, we do see that they do have inflammatory back conditions, you know, in the spondyl arthropathy realm, which a lot of times they are HLA-B27 negative. It's more common in males to have a positive test. And I would say the book answer for, you know, prevalence is that, you know, much more skewed towards males. As I look more, you know, I'm finding a lot more disease in females, and I would say that ratio is probably approaching, you know, 60-40 male to female ratio currently in, in patients that I evaluate. So I don't know who still uses that clofenac out there, but I, I don't, you know. Um, but, you know, again, anti-inflammatories are going to help spondyl arthropathy, and that's what they're really getting at in this question. Um, you know, so, yeah, that clofenac really kind of tears up people's stomachs. So um, if you're using some of the older NSAIDs out there, I mean, it's okay, but you're not going to make a lot of friends, you know, except GI because they're going to do some scopes if you use that type of stuff for a long time. How do I feel about it? Um, I, I think it's a good option for patients with, with renal disease um, in particular. Um, the one caution um, you want to give patients to, they want to put it on the axial spine. So um, it's absorption. I, there was, gosh, I'm going to date myself, probably about 20 years ago, there was a young track runner in Florida, and she figured if a little bit of Bengay would help her, a lot would help her. So she coated her whole body in Bengay, put on a track suit, ran a 400, and died. Um, and so that's really what they're looking at for absorption. Yes, there's limited absorption with, um, you know, the topical NSAIDs. But if you read the package insert, it's like two joints, like a knee, an elbow, and not on the spine. So, again, people like to put stuff on, but you just got to be careful because they like to put stuff on. And so um, I think they're a good option. You know, I get a 50-50 split. You know, you get some folks, you know, that, you know, non-surgical candidate, you know, injections don't work. They like to put stuff on. 
I think it's a good option, especially those with renal insufficiency. Of course, you want to monitor it because there is some absorption. But I don't think it's bad, and it's nice it's over the counter and doesn't cost a fortune now, too. Sure. So, I mean, the best advice I can give you with risk, you know, really, I did my cardiology rotation, internal medicine, man, I got hammered. Like, everything's risk assessment, right? Risk assessment. Risk assessment, Dave. Why are you not doing risk assessment? There's always a risk. Always a risk. You know, whether that you're on, you know, Coumadin, you know, they've got, you know, Crohn's disease, you know, they've had an MI in the past, they have a history of heart failure. You know, these are all the patients that we see, right? So there's always risk, right? I balance risk with benefit. And this is what I go over with patients, you know, time and time again, you know, particularly elderly patients with a lot of comorbidities. You know, and the thing is, you know, as long as their creatinine is reasonable, you know, um, you know, they're not dialysis range or had issues. It troubles a lot of people to self-medicate, right, especially with spondyl arthropathy. I don't see a lot of these cases. They realize they take naproxen or ibuprofen over the counter. They feel great. They couldn't do that in the 50s and 60s. You needed a prescription, right? Um, and so we see a lot of these patients where there's a risk factor, whether or not they've had a heart attack before, you know, perhaps they're on a blood thinner, you know, there, there's always a risk there, but we balance that with quality of life and improvement of life. You know, and plenty of folks come to me like, look, I had a heart attack, but I can't move my back without meloxicam. And if you don't prescribe it for me, my life is terrible. And so you look at adjusted quality years of life versus quantity of life. You know, that patient is going to be much happier to get meloxicam and die of a heart attack in 10 years than if I don't give meloxicam and he lives 15 years in misery every day. And so that's always, you know, a risk that you have to go over and benefit with each patient individually, whether or not they're a good candidate for NSAIDs. And we had this discussion about a patient at the VA yesterday where, you know, guy's had a heart attack, he has perhaps psoriasis, maybe some inflammation in the mid-back, you know, he's had heart failure before, so we're kind of like skewing what, what we can do for him. I said, well, he might be an naproxen, you know, patient. You know, they, they've gone back and forth about risk. You know, initially they said naproxen maybe has some more COX-1 inhibition. It's a little bit safer on the aspirin spectrum than a COX-2. <clears throat> but, you know, I don't know. There's no right answer for some of these patients. There's only an answer. In a trial of naproxen for a couple weeks, you know, isn't going to be the end-all, be-all. But sometimes for NSAIDs or COX-2 inhibitors, you know, I consider them a trial just like any other medication. I try it for 10 days. Stop it. You let me know. And a lot of times I get that response, you know, for psoriatic arthritis, we'll start meloxicam. So take it for two weeks. You let me know if it helps. I get a call in two weeks, not helping, stopping it. I say, okay. I snicker to myself, you know, three days later I get an email. Nope, 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 I was wrong. I feel significantly better. Uh, you were right. I'm going to keep taking the meloxicam. You know, I'll see you in six months. So, you know, it depends on improvement, number one, your risk assessment, the patient's risk assessment, you know, what they want to, what they want out of your visit and what they want out of therapy, which is a long answer to your short question. Patient dependent. But always do a risk assessment. All right, I think we've got one more question. Um, so anyway, this is refractory disease. So a patient's already on methotrexate. You know, she has psoriasis, nail pitting, right, slam dunk, um, and persistent inflammation. Um, and they did an aspirate, you know, the cell count's greater than 500, so it's inflammatory. Um, so really that's when, you know, you're looking at more advanced therapy. Like I said, the ones that they're going to hit home on the boards are, are typically Enbro, which is not good for inflammatory bowel disease, infliximab, um, and Humira are the big three. Um, so usually kind of first line for DMARD um, and NSAID failure for psoriatic arthritis is a TNF inhibitor, um, which provides benefit for both the psoriasis and um, psoriatic arthritis. Rarely you can get um, incidents on any patient taking a TNF inhibitor. They can get um, hand and foot palmar plantar uh, postular psoriasis. It's kind of a, you know, a, a, in idiosyncratic reaction where you think that something that treats psoriasis would make psoriasis go away, but you can get incidence of psoriasis in using TNF inhibitors, which is strange. I'm mean, usually, you know, hands and feet. Any questions or concerns or patients that you want to review with me while you have my attention? All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Sure thing. Yeah. I try to make it interactive. Yeah, it was sometimes great. I, sometimes, I, sometimes I bring prizes. That really gets people oh, interactive. Yeah. You know. You know. But gotta get the feel for everybody first. That's right. That's right. Before I go full Armstrong. That's right. That's right.